Complaints about the decline of musical taste begin only a little later than mankind's twofold discovery on the threshold of historical time that music represents at once the immediate manifestation of impulse and the locus of its taming. It stirs up the dance of the maenads and sounds from Pan's bewitching flute, but it also rings out from the Orphic lyre around which the visions of violence range themselves, pacified. Whenever their peace seems to be disturbed by bacchantic agitation, there is talk of the decline of taste. But if the disciplining function of music has been handed down since Greek philosophy as a major good, then certainly the pressure to be permitted to obey musically, as elsewhere, is today more general than ever. Just as the current musical consciousness of the masses can scarcely be called Dionysian, so its latest changes have nothing to do with taste. The concept of taste is itself outmoded. The group of nuns dead set on preventing Katy Perry from moving into their former convent for what should be obvious reasons coming from Catholic nuns. Say the sale has been marred by lies and morphine-influenced affidavits. The nuns filed a suit against the archdiocese last month over the proposed sale of the sprawling property situated on a Los Feliz hilltop with expansive views of downtown Los Angeles and the San Gabriel Mountains, the Los Angeles Times reports. The legal battle arises out of competing deals to sell the parcel. The archdiocese is trying to push an all-cash sale to known sinner Katy Perry, while the nuns would prefer to see the land go to a chaste developer, who would pay $100,000 up front and $10 million on a promissory note. The court case is essentially asking a judge to determine which group has the authority to sell the property, but the issues some faith-based, some legal, run much deeper. The archdiocese, the nuns say, has repeatedly lied to them and tried to bully them into selling to Perry, who they apparently object to on moral grounds. Responsible art adjusts itself to criteria which approximate judgments, the harmonious and the inharmonious, the correct and the incorrect, but otherwise, no more choices are made. The question is no longer put, and no one demands the subjective justification of the conventions. The very existence of the subject who could verify such taste has become as questionable as has, at the opposite pole, the right to a freedom of choice which, empirically, in any case, no one any longer exercises. If one seeks to find out who likes, a commercial piece, one cannot avoid the suspicion that liking and disliking are inappropriate to the situation, even if the person questioned clothes his reaction in those words. The familiarity of the piece is a surrogate for the quality ascribed to it. To like it is almost the same thing as to recognize it. An approach in terms of value judgments has become a fiction for the person who finds himself hemmed in by standardized musical goods. This is not about me. Thankfully, I'm on my fifth album and can support myself, my band, crew, and entire management team by playing live shows. This is about the new artist or band that has just released their first single and will not be paid for its success. This is about the young songwriter who just got his or her first cut and thought that the royalties from that would get them out of debt. This is about the producer who works tirelessly to innovate and create, just like the innovators and creators at Apple are pioneering in their field but will not get paid for a quarter of a year's worth of plays on his or her songs. These are not the complaints of a spoiled, petulant child. These are the echoed sentiments of these are the echoed sentiments of every artist, 
writer, and producer in my social circles, who are afraid to speak up publicly because we admire and respect Apple so much. We simply do not respect this particular call. He can neither escape impotence nor decide between the offerings where everything is so completely identical that preference, in fact, depends merely on biographical details or on the situation in which things are heard. The categories of autonomously oriented art have no applicability to the contemporary reception of music. Not even for that of the serious music, domesticated under that barbarous name of classical, so as to enable one to turn away from it again in comfort. If it is objected that specifically light music and everything intended for consumption have in any case never been experienced in terms of those categories, that must certainly be conceded. Nevertheless, such music is also affected by the change in the entertainment, the pleasure, the enjoyment it promises, is given only to be simultaneously denied. In one of his essays, Aldous Huxley has raised the question of who, in place of amusement, is really being amused. With the same justice, it can be asked whom music for entertainment still entertains. Rather, it seems to complement the reduction of people to silence, the dying out of speech as expression, the inability to communicate at all. It inhabits the pockets of silence that develop between people molded by anxiety, work, and undemanding docility. Everywhere it takes over, unnoticed, the deadly sad role that fell to it in the time and the specific situation of the silent films. It is perceived purely as background. If nobody can any longer speak, then certainly nobody can any longer listen. Stuart, did you drop out of school, Justin? Bieber, no, I finished high school with a 4.0 GPA. Stuart, you did, okay. And in 2010, you released My World 2.0 and Baby went platinum. That must have been so exciting. You really changed your life. Bieber, I did. I moved from Stratford to Atlanta and I met Usher pretty much right away. And that's the relationship that got me the platform, really, to do everything. When he signed me, he called all the radio stations with me and got them to believe in me. We worked with a lot of great people from the start. Tricky and The Dream actually wrote Baby, and they wrote a lot of big hits like Single Ladies by Beyonce. So it was cool to be able to work with them right from the jump. We released that as the first single, and like you said, it went platinum. Stuart, where do you have the platinum record? Bieber, I think it's in Stratford at my grandmother's house, if I'm not mistaken. Stuart, she must be very excited. Bieber, yeah, her whole basement is full of plaques and stuff. We've been doing that since before I was famous, just like when I would win track and field and stuff at school. Stuart, what's your favorite mode of transportation, Justin? Bieber, probably private jet. That's the quickest and most comfortable. Stuart, do you have a jet? Bieber, I don't own a jet, but I rent jets in my spare time. An American specialist in radio advertising, who indeed prefers to make use of the musical medium, has expressed skepticism as to the value of this advertising, because people have learned to deny their attention to what they are hearing even while listening to it. His observation is questionable with respect to the advertising value of music, but it tends to be right in terms of the reception of the music itself. In the conventional complaints about declining taste, certain motifs constantly recur. There is no lack of pouting and sentimental comments assessing the current musical condition of the masses as one of degeneration. The most tenacious of these motifs is that of sensuality, which allegedly enfeebles and incapacitates heroic behavior. 
This complaint can already be found in Book Three of Plato's Republic, in which he bans the harmonies expressive of sorrow, as well as the soft harmonies suitable for drinking, without its being clear to this day why the philosopher ascribes these characteristics to the mixed Lydian, Lydian, base Lydian, and Ionian modes. In the Platonic state, the major of later Western music, which corresponds to the Ionian, would have been tabooed. The flute and the panharmonic stringed instruments also fall under the ban. The only modes to be left are warlike, to sound the note or accent which a brave man utters in the hour of danger and stern resolve, or when he faces injury, defeat, or death, or any other misfortune with the same steadfast endurance. But really, we should have seen this one coming. Miranda Lambert's 2014 smash Platinum was probably bursting with clues that there just might be trouble in paradise. The most flagrant example was, of course, Priscilla, whose bouncy beat and trademark Lambert sass belied the sadness and frustration, tear-staining the lyrics. The woman who wrote those words was hurting, chafing under the pressure of being married to a superstar the queen to his king, as it were. It's tough to see something so nakedly despondent from a woman who's built an empire on a message of empowerment, a powerhouse voice, and a take-no-shit attitude. But it humanizes her as well. Even queens cry. Despite Shelton's bro-country marquee status, Lambert's no slouch herself. She's probably one of country's biggest stars in her own right. It's telling that she felt such a kinship with one of rock and roll's most famously long-suffering ex-wives, and had little trouble equating her husband with a certain other lusted-after bad boy. Like a good southerner, well-versed with keeping up appearances, though, she brushed off the comparison in an interview, saying, It happens, and it's happening a lot lot more to Blake and I than ever before, and I thought it was a really smart take on how it happens, and I definitely don't want people to think I'm comparing us to Priscilla and Elvis in any stretch of the imagination. You sure about that, Miranda? Plato's ethical musical program bears the character of an attic purge in Spartan style. Other perennial themes of musical sermonizing are on the same level. Among the most prominent of these are the charge of superficiality and that of a cult of personality. What is attacked is chiefly progress, social, essentially the specifically aesthetic. Intertwined with the forbidden allurements are sensual gaiety and differentiating consciousness. The predominance of the person over collective compulsion in music marks the moment of subjective freedom which breaks through in later phases, while the profanation which frees it from its magic circle appears as superficiality. A petition recently launching to prevent Kanye West from playing the closing ceremony of the Pan American Games in Toronto later this month has now reached the 50,000 signature mark. The Pan Am Games, which takes place every four years, recently announced the rapper would perform to close the event on July 26th. However, the decision has evoked a lot of criticism. The petition calling for West to be dropped from the bill reads, The Toronto Pan Am Games have proven to be very important for Torontonians this year and have triggered a unified sense of pride for our city. It would only be just to ask a proud Torontonian, or even a Canadian for that matter, in the music industry to perform, such as Drake, Walk Off the Earth, Feist, Metric, Shania Twain, Dead Mouse Five, Crystal Castles, Zed's Dead, The Weeknd, Peaches, Kanan, and many, many more. Mark Day, the deputy leader of the Ontario Green Party, even took to Twitter to describe the hip-hop star as an obnoxious, no-talent asshole. But 
What are emancipated from the formal law are no longer the productive impulses which rebelled against conventions. Impulse, subjectivity, and profanation, the old adversaries of materialistic alienation, now succumb to it. In capitalist times, the traditional anti-mythological ferments of music conspire against freedom as whose allies they were once prescribed. The representatives of the opposition to the authoritarian schema become witnesses to the authority of commercial success. The delight in this moment and gay facade becomes an excuse for resolving the listener from the thought of the whole, whose claim is comprised in proper listening. The listener is converted along his line of least resistance to the acquiescent purchaser. No longer do the partial moments serve as critique of that whole. Instead, they suspend the critique, which the successful aesthetic totally exerts against the flawed one of society. The unitary synthesis is sacrificed to them. They no longer produce their own in place of a reified one, but show themselves complacent to it. The isolated moments of enjoyment prove incompatible with the imminent constitution of the work of art, and whatever in the work goes beyond them to an essential perception is sacrificed to them. They are not bad in themselves, but in their diversionary function. In the service of success, they renounce that insubordinate character which was theirs. But of late, those lines have blurred. In the year of the Grateful Dead's 50th anniversary, the quintessential jam band appears to have greater currency than ever among the indie, the underground, the generally weird. Members of the National plot an indie rock stocked Grateful Dead tribute album. Stephen Malkmus drops musical references to St. Stephen in his recent album. And more and more indie artists find themselves a safe space to talk dead fandom in a public forum. The star-studded Freaks After Show was one of dozens in Chicago on the 4th of July weekend, a constellation of barnacles riding the blue whale of Fare Thee Well, the Grateful Dead's 50th anniversary celebration and semi-reunion send-off. But where most of these bills were predictable combinations of Grateful Dead collaborators and jam world descendants, the Freaks gig at City Winery stuck out. Besides guitarists from two of the most influential acts in indie rock history, the lineup included Jenny Lewis, Little Wing's Kyle Field, Nicholas Jar collaborators Dan Harrington and Will Epstein, and Chicago singer-songwriter Riley Walker. Though there was more plaid than tie-dye in evidence, the crowd showed no reservations about the smooth jazz of Eyes of the World or the earnest sing-along to Buddy Holly's Not Fade Away. They conspire to come to terms with everything which the isolated moment can offer to an isolated individual who long ago ceased to be one. In isolation, the charms become dulled and furnish models of the familiar. Whoever devotes himself to them is as malicious as the Greek thinkers once were towards oriental sensuality. The seductive power of the charm survives only where the forces of denial are strongest, in the dissonance which rejects belief in the illusion of the existing harmony. The concept of the ascetic is itself dialectical in music. If asceticism once struck down the claims of the aesthetic in a reactionary way, it has today become the sign of advanced art. Not, to be sure, by an archaicizing parsimony of means in which deficiency and poverty are manifested, but by the strict exclusion of all culinary delights which seek to be consumed immediately for their own sake, as if in art the sensory were not the bearer of something intellectual, which only shows itself in the whole rather than in isolated topical moments. Art records negatively just that possibility of happiness which the only partially positive anticipation of happiness ruinously confronts today. All light and pleasant art has become illusory and mendacious. 
What makes its appearance aesthetically in the pleasure categories can no longer give pleasure, and the promise of happiness, once the definition of art, can no longer be found except where the mask has been torn from the countenance of false happiness. Enjoyment still retains a place only in the immediate bodily presence, where it requires an aesthetic appearance. It is illusory by aesthetic standards and likewise cheats the pleasure seeker out of itself. Only where its appearance is lacking is the faith in its possibility maintained. My name is Mike Rignetta, and this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. The text of this episode of Reasonably Sound is from On the Fetish Character in Music and the Regression of Listening by Theodore W. Adorno, interspersed with articles from Gawker, Taylor Swift's Tumblr, Fashionista, Noisy, NME, and Pitchfork. I'll put links to all of those articles on the post for this episode on infiniteguest.org. Otherwise, you can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at ReasonablySND, and you can find me on Twitter, Tumblr, and Instagram at Mike Rugnetta. <laughs>